Uh, those of you who are here in person, it's wonderful to be with all of you who are here at home with us and with us in spirit and with us in voice tonight in praise. Uh, I'm excited about that. I'm excited. This is a long overdue, in some respects, step in my mind for our congregation to take to move into a hybrid of the footprint of our church moving beyond the square footage of our church. And uh, that's an important concept of church, which we're going to look at here tonight. The idea that what exactly is the church affects your whole identity and affects your whole kind of mission mindset in life. Uh, before we get started, I want to make a couple quick announcements. Uh, number one, the annual congregational cel uh, celebration or annual congregation uh, business meeting, I should say. The annual celebration is typically what we call the event in January. Uh, the congregation business meeting, which really is like our one major business meeting during the year is held in June, uh, and this week, or this month, it is the Wednesday of this week, 7 o'clock, Wednesday night. Uh, it'll be right here in person in the sanctuary, and then it's also going to be available via Zoom. And the link for that is going to be in our weekly email, which comes out on Tuesday. So if you're not signed up for not just my weekly email, but the weekly email, the St. Marcus weekly email. You go to our website, you click on church, you scroll to the bottom, and you enter in your uh, email information. This is how you do it. And you enter it in in order to get the weekly email sent specifically to you. That'll have the Zoom code so that you can plug in wherever you are. You can take part in that meeting, okay? We do things like we approve a budget. We approve uh, upcoming officers for the congregation. Uh, it's the one time of the year that we actually do, uh, at least I do, a little bit of like kind of what I might call vision casting for the congregation for the upcoming year. So we look at what did we learn this past year and how does that affect where we're moving in the upcoming year. That will all be available uh, in person on Wednesday or via Zoom on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, okay? Uh, if you come here in person, you can come in through any one of the normal entrances and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the second thing that I want to mention upcoming this week is a lot of you were able to check out uh, about two weeks ago we did a kind of sit down with some leaders in the congregation uh, that we, we just called it George Floyd advancing the conversation as Christians. And what it was is saying, okay, at a time where we're hearing a lot of information going on about what we should think and what we should feel uh, in society, especially as it relates to things like social justice and race relations, uh, more than anything, the voice that we want to hear is the voice of God. And the, the closest thing that we can get to the voice of God coming in human form is, okay, who are the Christians uh, that would particularly be in these circumstances and what do they have to say about stuff? So I sat down with uh, three black men who are leaders in the congregation, either in study or in specific uh, volunteer roles or in uh, Ron's case, the pastoral uh, ministry, and asked them, you know, how do recent events uh, how do they shape your opinion of things? Uh, where does the church, where do we need to change? That kind of stuff. And uh, there's a lot of good conversation that came out of it. And actually a lot of you were able to participate in watching that. And a, a, it got a lot of people watching and talking and listening. And so we're going to continue during the course of the summer following up with conversations like that. And they can be sometimes, you know, awkward conversations, admittedly. And so you just got to go into it as humbly as possible. Um, and I'm just going to try to do a lot of listening because first and foremost, like me personally, I benefit from these conversations. Um, but our church benefits from these conversations. And furthermore, what I gained from the participation from people outside of our church community is other people are benefiting from them too. And so this is maybe something that we can offer to our collection of churches and church body as well. And so we're going to continue that conversation this week, Thursday night at 7 o'clock. I'm going to be having a conversation with some women to get their input on some of the same types of issues, and I'm really looking forward to that. Hoping you can join us either on Facebook or YouTube. If you're not subscribed to those pages, make sure that you do so so that you can get them sent, uh, get alerts directly from those, okay? Uh, the last thing that I want to mention tonight then is that our worship series, we're continuing during the course of the summer doing a worship series called Messy Christianity, which basically is our study of 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians, if you don't know, is like amongst the many churches that the Apostle Paul helps plant, 1 Corinthians is kind of like uh, the troubled child of his churches. They experience the same kind of problems that all the other churches experience except to like a greater degree. That doesn't mean God loves them less. In fact, some ways God shows greater grace to those uh, particular kinds of churches and those people. Uh, but they need a little bit of additional guidance too. And we're going to get tonight again at what some of the root problem is going on in Corinth. The root problem is they're too worldly. 
They think, even though they're Christian, even though they know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they think and they operate exactly like the rest of the world. And Paul has to, like, from the inside out, from the foundation up, eviscerate that type of thinking. And if there, that exists in our lives, we need to get rid of it too and repent of that. And we're going to have the opportunity to do so here tonight. So we're, we're worshiping under the theme of the end of self. With that said, I think we've got everything we need for tonight. I'd ask that you please rise as we join in worship.
brothers and sisters, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Wherever we are tonight, whether here in person or worshiping with us at home, we gather tonight with one heart, one faith, and one voice, stating that we live in a fallen world and admitting that we ourselves have contributed to that fallenness. And so tonight we confess together, Lord God, through your powerful word, you brought order into the world from chaos. In our thoughts, words, and actions, however, we are guilty of creating sinful chaos by disobeying your word. Please have mercy on us and forgive us through the blood of your son, Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are not saved by your perfection. You're saved by the perfection of God's Son, who loved you so dearly that he died in your place. And your mess became his death, but his perfection has become your righteousness for all eternity. Lift your voices this evening to the praise of the God who creates, sustains, and works all things for your good. Thanks be to God. Congregation may be seated. As we listen to our first lesson, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 15 tonight, and then in a moment we're going to take a, a deeper look at the verses that immediately follow after this. But remember, the Apostle Paul is building on the idea that the Corinthian church struggles with worldliness. We've talked about this in the past two weeks. The difference between living out of flesh and living out of faith. Uh, those of you who are in our, our growth groups, one of the first questions that we're going to look at this coming week, it might, in fact, it might be the first question on the study guide, but one of the questions is, agree or disagree, if you are a disciple of Christ, you will look weird in the world. Now, some of us might look weird, not for particularly godly reasons, we might just, you know, uh, I've been some, so in other words, if you say, well, people have been calling me weird my whole life, so I must be incredibly godly. Uh, that, that doesn't necessarily, one doesn't necessarily equate to the other, but nonetheless, the fact that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you're functioning out of a different spirit. You're functioning out of faith, not flesh. And so what you do with your time, what you do with your finances, what you do with your relationships, what you do with uh, conflict resolution in your life, it's going to come out differently if you're operating out of faith, not flesh. And Paul is constantly talking to these Corinthians and saying, Stop acting just like the people of the value system of this world and act like you are people who are part of the body of Christ. So, 1 Corinthians 3, beginning with verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, well, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not acting as just mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on that. But each one of you should build with care. For no one laid any foundation other than the one which was already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, eventually their work is going to be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, then the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, then the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. And for now, this is the word of the Lord. We'll join in singing our song for the day. Can we rise as we sing together?
Go ahead and be seated. Thank you. The text we're looking at tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 16 and we're going to make our way all the way to chapter 4, verse 7. That is a fairly long reading. And because it covers really into two chapters and four paragraphs, uh, I'm not going to read it all at first up front because then we'd have to kind of retrace a lot of our steps. So I'm going to read it as we work our way through the text, okay? As we start, the thing that I want you to understand is, again, the background to what we've been looking through in, Christ, uh, in 1 Corinthians. Again, our theme for worship has been messy Christianity. It's been a study of 1 Corinthians that we're doing all summer. And eventually, what the Apostle Paul is going to do is he's going to work his way into some very practical implications of what he's teaching the Corinthians. So eventually, we're going to get in two weeks where he's talking about sexual immorality, gender identity, marriage and divorce, uh, lawsuits amongst believers, idolatry, abuse of freedoms. Um, he's going to talk about things in worship, like propriety in worship and spiritual gifting. He's going to talk about a perception of death and the afterlife. All of those, those are really relevant things for making your way through life and navigating a fallen world as a Christian. He's not into those yet, though. What he's doing first is he's getting into the issue that's underneath all those other issues. The, the thing that causes all those other issues to manifest themselves. And that issue is the issue of spiritual pride. See, the Corinthians, what seems to be happening is a self-righteousness that looks like this. The people in the church in Corinth are latching on to various teachers and various leaders that they're identifying with. And they're saying, you know what, I'm specifically a follower of Paul or Apollos or Cephas or, or whomever. And they're identifying that way, which was a very worldly way to go about identifying themselves because, you know, the Greek people in the city of Corinth and really throughout Greece, the way people identify themselves is which of the gods am I particularly devout in, devout in worshiping? Which of the philosophers do I really like to sit at the feet of and learn from? Who's, teacher, who's the teacher that I have adopted the, the lifestyle approach of? That sort of thing. And they're taking that mentality, identifying who I am by which leaders I attach myself to, and they're bringing that mentality into the church. And they're elevating certain characteristics of their favorite teachers, and they're looking down on everybody else who doesn't abide by or line up with that favorite teacher, and they're kind of like condescending to them. It's causing divisions in the church. And Paul says, stop being so worldly. You know, we, we talked about this last week. The Jews are constantly looking for demonstrations of power, and the Greeks are constantly looking for demonstration of fantastic wisdom, and you guys got to stop operating out of the flesh. You have to start operating out of what you now are, which is in the cross of Jesus Christ. Operate out of a cross mentality. And if you would actually do that, it would change your perception of your own identity. Because when you enter into Christ, you become a different person than who you are and how you define yourself outside of Jesus Christ. And so the very first thing, uh, when Paul starts talking about this pride and this self-righteousness and the divisions it's causing in the church, he says, no, operate with a cross mentality, not with a flesh mentality. And if you can look at yourself through the lens the lens of Jesus Christ's cross, the lens of God's promises to you, you'll see yourself as a very different person. And so let's start with your identity and then talk about how you live out of that identity. And that's the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. And he starts this whole section with verses 16 and 17 by saying the following. He says, Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. So again, he's going to teach us tonight in four different paragraphs. In each paragraph is a slightly different thought that progresses on the prior paragraph. And the very first thing, the foundation of all of this, is the teaching, you are the temple of God. You're the temple of God. This is a teaching that is one of those teachings that somehow the Christian church at large... You know, I generally don't like to talk quite like this, but I think that the Christian church at large has maybe missed this for potentially like ma millennia. Since we started building cathedrals, I think we've been missing this thought. This is not the church. You are the church. Okay? 
brick and mortar buildings, like using expressions like let's go to church or we build like this with our, our hands, a church. That is not the church. You are the church. The New Testament is constantly teaching us this. The Apostle Paul in Acts 16 says, God does not live in temples that are built by human hands. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, each of you are building blocks that are moved together to create the structure, the temple in which God dwells by his spirit. I don't know if after a coronavirus pandemic we'll finally understand this point, but you don't have to gather in a certain magical building in order to exist as a church. This is not the church. You are the church. And therefore, the, the basic idea, by the way, this affects not only your mentality in regards to God, but it affects your identity in, in concept of you. It gives you a missional mindset that says, no, ministry is not just done within the confines of these walls. Ministry is done wherever you go. At least God, that's what God intends for it to, to happen. And so, what does it mean? You are the temple of God, the place in which he dwells by his spirit, and that gives you an identity out of which to live your life, a purpose, and you are the dwelling place of God wherever you are. Now, with that understood, that premise, he goes on to say, okay, stop thinking so much like the world, knowing now who you are. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you think that you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All of them are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. So here's what he's doing. He's taking that concept of you are the temple of God, his, his premise statement, and let's push that analogy a little bit further. If what you are as the temple of God is you are building blocks who are fitted together with other believers to form the place in which God dwells, what that means then, look, it gives you a twofold understanding of yourself that is really helpful. Number one, it says that you're infinitely valuable. Why? Because if I'm a building block in the temple of God, what happens when you take away a building block? If, if you're playing Jenga and you take out one of the, the bottom pieces, the whole thing topples. So like if, what that means is God's, God's people need you. They need you. They need you to use the time that God has given you, the money that God has given you, the energy that God has given you, the specific gifts that he poured into you. God's people need those in order to survive, and God is seeking to dwell in you, dwelling together, moving together. That, makes, that means you are infinitely valuable. Don't ever think otherwise. On the other hand, it also gives us a perception of humility. Why? Because if you're a building block in the temple of God, how good is one building block by itself? So if you're wandering out there in the wilderness, and you know humans can't survive in the elements for very long, which should also keep us humble. It doesn't matter how good the weather is. Uh, whether it's cold or hot or whatever, humans can't exist. Like, we can't actually survive just in the elements. And so if you're caught in a snowstorm or a rainstorm or a heat wave or whatever, it doesn't matter. You're not going to survive very long without shelter. And yet, if you were walking through the wilderness and you saw one building block and you decided to lay down by that building block and said, ah, I have found shelter, you're out of luck. The elements are still going to get you because that one building block, if it isn't connected to all the others, it's of no use. It can't actually accomplish its purpose. And that should make you very humble. Why on earth, if I'm, <laughs> if functionally on my own, I am of no particular use, then why should I ever boast about myself or boast about any other person who can't accomplish much of anything on their own? Don't boast simply in humans, others or yourself. See, do you understand the balance? If you're building blocks in the temple of God, you're at the same time infinitely valuable and you should be incredibly humble. See? Now, all of that lays the foundation for what Paul is going to say here in the next verses, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 4. And I'm going to, I don't want to oversell this, but this is going to be like of the top 10 things, particularly as somebody who has at various points struggled with mental health in my life. What I'm about to teach you here is in the top 10 points of everything I've ever learned in the Bible. Okay? Uh, so sit tight. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. This, then, is how you ought to regard us, Paul says, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. 
Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And here's what he says that is so revolutionary and powerful. He says, I care very little if I'm judged by you, or for that matter, by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't actually make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, Paul is bringing kind of an otherworldly wisdom here that is really pretty extraordinary. And I'm going to I'm going to tell you, a lot of what I'm going to share with you now is from a little uh, book, actually kind of a booklet, um, called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. It won't surprise a lot of you that know I'm a Keller fan. It's, it's a Keller writing. And by the way, I think I lent it out to one of you, and somebody has not returned it to me. I was looking for it earlier this week, and I spent too much time, and I'm like, all right, I'm not going to make you raise your hand right now and publicly shame, but pretty sure someone's got it, and I could use it back because it's got notes in it. Anyways... Essentially, what Keller says is prior to the 20th century, the vast majority of the world looked at the problems that existed in society as a problem that is caused by individuals having too high of a perception of themselves. Okay? In other words, um, in traditional cultures, what people basically said is, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when I mentioned, you know, sociologists have noted that one of the few character traits that can be linked from cult leaders to dictators, to celebrities, and otherwise, is the trait of narcissism, it's excessive self-love. And therefore, since a lot of the world for a long time viewed that, excessive self-love, as kind of the underlying cause to many of the world's bad behaviors, um, essentially what we said is the cause of violence, the cause of oppression, the cause of tyranny, the cause of... You know, why do people do bad things? It's because they have an overly inflated sense of self, view themselves as better than everybody else, and therefore do bad things to other people that they perceive as beneath them. Now, by and large, people don't think that way anymore. People don't think that humans behave badly because they have high opinions of themselves, and we don't think that way in part because of something called the Enlightenment. Uh, I'm not going to get into a huge history of it here, but the Euro European Enlightenment was a couple century period in which there was a shift from thinking about the greater group to thinking about specifically the individual. Now, not everything that came out of that was bad, because I'm going to talk kind of bad about it here in a second, but I want you to note that not everything that came out of European Enlightenment was bad stuff. Because, uh, so for instance, the, the idea of rights of the individual, Americans think humans have always there's always been inalienable rights with every human being. No, there hasn't. No, there has not. And that's why prior to the Enlightenment, uh, you have a lot of uh, abuses in child labor laws. You have abuses, uh, more, abuses like slavery. Nobody was debating slavery at that time, believe it or not. Obviously, we understand the wrongness of it today. But prior to understanding the dignity and inherent worth and value and rights that were kind of taught to us, these biblical underlying principles that came in the European Enlightenment, nobody really thought that way. Now, after the Enlightenment, the idea of respect for the individual became a huge thing and kind of the basis for a lot of our thinking uh, about society. But in the process, what happened is we stopped thinking about, like, the group as a whole, and we started thinking more just in terms of the individual. And the end result of that or at least one of the end results of that, was we started to think, okay, why do people do bad things? If, the, you know, if we think more in terms of the individual self, the reason and, bad, reason and cause of bad behavior is not that people have too high of a view of self, but they have too low of a view of self. And so when an individual doesn't experience acceptance, when an, when an individual is not loved enough, by their parents. That's where we started to believe that's why people act out. That's why people behave poorly. And if you're, you're not familiar with that, just understand most of our public systems in America are set up essentially that way from education to politics to mental health care to criminal reform. Most of it is predicated on the idea that bad behavior does not stem as a result of too high of a view of itself, but of too low of a view of self. And therefore, what we try to do is we try to remedy low self-esteem by giving somebody high self-esteem. Now, I already tried to point to some of the problems that are attached to that, 
uh, the biggest problem just in general being there is no research out there that suggests that if you have an extremely high opinion of yourself, you are of any greater good to society. That you are more charitable, more compassionate, more generous, more forgiving, more peace-loving. In fact, uh, the more we become a celebrity-driven society, uh, the more we have leaders who seem at, at any way, in any shape, to be really full of themselves, the more we start to understand that, you know, a really high opinion of yourself probably isn't the solution to a lot of society's ills. And in fact, from a clinical standpoint, uh, there's kind of a famous study that was uh, done in a, a, an article that was written in the New York Times Magazine back, published in the early 2000s. Um, it's done by a psychologist by the name of Lauren Slater, and I'm just going to read what she has here. Uh, she refers to three major studies done in the early 2000s. She says, in 2001, three high-profile studies of self-esteem found that people with high self-esteem pose a greater threat to society than people with low self-esteem. To feel bad about ourselves isn't the cause of societal problems, but rather feeling good and confident about ourselves is actually more of a cause and danger. And it's especially difficult given that self-esteem has entered so much of our social consciousness and self-perception. She says, rehabilitation programs focus on self-esteem. Statements like, today I will accept myself for who I am, are commonplace to remind ourselves that high self-esteem is an important part of who we are. Now, Slater goes on to say that self the self-esteem movement has become something of a quasi-religion, and she says, we have developed a discourse of affirmation. To deviate from that would be to enter an another arena entirely, linguistically and grammatically, so that what came out of our mouths would be socially impolite at best and unintelligible at worst. Now, do you hear what she's saying? I won't go too much further into this, but here's what I'm trying to say. Everybody understands that low self-esteem is a problem, and it makes us miserable. But what the world has done, what most modern psychology has done for a long time, is attempted to remedy low self-esteem with high self-esteem. But what she's saying, what Paul will say, what I'm saying, is the research out there seems to indicate that really, really high self-esteem doesn't actually solve the problem either. That can make you a danger to the people around you because you look down on them. So what I'm about to show you, what the Apostle Paul says, is different from anything any purely secular counselor I've ever heard say. Here's what he says. He says, I care very little if I am judged by you, the Corinthians, or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Now listen to what he's saying. I don't care all that much what you think of me. That's different than saying, I don't care about you. Does Paul, the Apostle Paul care about the Corinthians? Yes, he says that again and again in virtually every chapter. Of course he cares about them. He says, I don't care what you think of me. I don't have a very strong opinion about your opinion and your verdict of me. And he says, for that matter, the human court, I don't even care all that much what the world thinks of me. Now, what a lot of modern counselors would do as they were listening to the Apostle Paul here is they would be nodding along and saying, yes, that is excellent. I don't, Paul, you're right. You shouldn't care so much what everybody else thinks of you. The only thing that would follow that up was saying, the only thing that really matters is, well, what do you think of you? Now, there's two problems with that, and we've already touched on that. What do you think of you? Number one, if the only thing that matters is what you actually think of yourself, then Hitler was totally justified in his own confidence and his own self-assurance. Just because you approve yourself, just because you feel good about yourself, that lends nothing to the idea that you are objectively good in any way, shape, or form. The other problem with, okay, the only thing that matters is what do I think of me? Okay, let's say that a bunch of other people outside of us approve of us. So the world approves of us and our peers approve of us, but some of us struggle with incredibly high standards that we never seem to meet on our own. In other words, the world might approve on us, but what if I just kind of hate myself all the time? And what I'm telling you is either an extraordinarily high view of yourself or an extraordinarily low view of yourself, the, the world's approach to identity formation, both of those don't work either. And so Paul doesn't say approach your identity formation like the world does. He says, don't worry so much what the world thinks about you and don't worry so much what the, uh, your peers think about you, but also 
don't worry so much what you think of you. Look at what he says here. This is brilliant. He says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't actually make me innocent. Just because somebody feels good about themselves, that doesn't let them off the hook. Again, think Hitler. Now, consciences, by the way, just a moment on conscience. Consciences are good things. Consciences are valuable things. Your conscience, if you don't know, it's like an alarm system that fires and goes off whenever you violated the natural knowledge of God. Or that's what it's supposed to do anyways. The problem, however, is that consciences, over time, they become culturally conditioned. And they become uh, habituated even by our own sinful behavior at various points. And therefore, while they're helpful, they're not always completely accurate. Just about everybody I know can rationalize their own bad behaviors. Just about everybody I know can at least find one other person that does some things worse than them and therefore feel good about themselves as a decent person by comparison. That does not objectively make us good people, and Paul knows that. By the way, What's further interesting about this is the Apostle Paul is at a later point going to say about himself in 1 Timothy 1, he's going to say, I am the chief of... Now, here's the thing. Modern people, including psychologists, there was a movement for a long time that says, don't you dare, religious people, don't you dare talk about sin because that makes people feel bad. And feeling bad is the worst possible thing that could happen to somebody. So, don't make people feel bad, don't talk about sin. Now, let me tell you, Does the Apostle Paul seem like a guy who's aware of his own sinfulness? Yes, chief of sinners though I be. Does the Apostle Paul seem like the type of guy who is completely crushed by the shame and weight and guilt of his own sins? Not at all. Not at all. Why? I can tell that because look at how much courage he has. Look how he talks to people. People who have incredibly low self-esteem, people who are wallowing in shame and guilt do not talk the way the Apostle Paul talks. He doesn't have a high opinion of himself, and he doesn't have a low opinion of himself. He says, chief of sinners though I be, but I'm not crushed by that. Now, how is he doing that? Nobody that I know thinks like that naturally. Here's the secret. Doesn't matter what you think of me. It doesn't matter what this world thinks of me. It doesn't matter what I think of me. The only thing that matters is what does God think of me. And the fact of the matter is, for the sake of Jesus Christ, the Lord has already judged me. And what has he said? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, that is, that is entirely different from any thought process or formation of identity and self that I have ever run across anywhere in the world. When all is said and done, Apostle Paul's argument here is the only opinion that actually matters is not what a sinful world thinks of me. It's not what a sinful person over there thinks of me. It's not what I myself think of me. In the grand scheme of things, what does that actually matter? The only opinion that actually has lasting impact on my future is the opinion of God. And what has he said about me? Because God has a cross mentality, because God looks at me through the lens of Jesus Christ, he says, yes, you are forgiven, you are righteous, you are holy, you are perfect. This is my child. This is my son. This is my daughter whom I loved. With him, I am well pleased. With her, I am well pleased. Because at the cross, Jesus took the verdict that should have been our verdict, the guilty verdict, and he he changed places with us. He gave us an irrevocably favorable verdict as we stand before God for all eternity. His, His identity at that moment became our identity. And there's only one thing that's necessary to receive that. In order to pick up his identity, you know what you have to do? You just got to let go of your own identity. To find your true self, you have to die to this self. To find your true life, you have got to, in a sense, kill this life, kill this self, kill this flesh daily, and rise in Christ daily. When his identity becomes your identity, you get this freedom of self-forgetfulness. That's the big idea. Now, if that's making sense to you, for those of you that if that's not making sense quite yet, continue to think about this idea that the verdict is already in. It already came on, on Jesus. He took your verdict and you get his verdict. Start to work that out in your head. But if that's starting to make sense, we can move on to verses 6 and 7. And here the Apostle Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? In other words, what did you do that was so great that wasn't gifted to you that you should be taking so much credit for and boasting in? Everything good that you have came as a perfect gift from the Father. 
coming down from uh, the heavenly lights. If you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? Here's, what, here's the thing. Here's going to be our final application point. I'm just going to highlight this one particular phrase here. That phrase in verse, uh, it's at the end of verse 6 that says, you will not be puffed up. Now, the older translations of that uh, would say things like uh, be arrogant or be conceited. And that gets at the right basic idea, but it's not the right image. The image here that Paul uses is very clear. This is a word that he only uses primarily in Corinthians. It's used one other time in Scripture. In Corinthians, it's used like six times. And the Greek word physiaomai, to me, means, what it literally means is to be overinflated, to be puffed up. It's not a bad translation. To be swollen. Now, here's an analogy that I heard that I thought was really helpful. Have you ever noticed that you only notice certain parts of your body when they don't feel good? Like, when your body feels great, you don't notice the parts. So, like, when you came in tonight, and if I asked you, how's it going? Nobody said, my, I'm wonderful. My arms feel fantastic tonight. You know, or my legs are doing, look at my legs go. They're phenomenal. You know, my back. The only reason you would say that is if at some point in time in recent past, it was hurting. Because the body only draws attention to itself when it's in pain. Now, do me a favor. Apply this to your emotional well-being. When people say things like, my feelings got hurt. Now, even sometimes people don't always say that, but when you're particularly moody, or when you're offended, or when somebody criticizes you and you can't handle it, when people say stuff like, my feelings are hurt, what do they mean? Now, I've counseled with people for a lot of years, and usually when I start off by saying, well, I, I, I've tried to correct the way I'm saying this, I've tried to learn, because it doesn't seem to click initially. But when I tell people, you don't actually have quote unquote feelings. You have emotions, but like think about it from a clinical standpoint. If a doctor said to you, if you said my feelings are hurt, and a doctor said, okay, point to where it hurts, where would you point? You don't actually have emotional feeling receptors. You have physical feeling receptors. So when you say my feelings are hurt, what do you actually mean? You mean my ego is bruised. My sense of self is hurt. My opinion of me actually hurts a lot. Now, what does it mean then if you're constantly getting your feelings hurt? What does it mean if you're constantly worrying? What does it mean if you're constantly forever thinking about yourself? What is the problem? The problem is your ego is swollen. And some of you are saying, no, 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 I don't brag. I don't, have, I don't have a huge opinion of myself. That's not the point. Whether you have a high opinion of yourself or you have a low opinion of yourself, what's the problem? You're obsessed with yourself. That's the problem. Your ego is swollen. It's inflamed. It's hurt. If you're constantly worrying, if you're constantly stressed, if you're constantly getting your feelings hurt, that means the arrow in your life is pointing at yourself way too much. The Apostle Paul gives us a way to reduce the inflammation. Don't think less of yourself and don't think more of yourself. Think of yourself less. Do you follow the difference? Don't think lowly of yourself and don't think highly of yourself. Think of yourself less. Lose yourself in Jesus Christ. If you believe that he has actually redeemed your life and you belong entirely to him, to the degree that you understand that, you will find the joy of self-forgetfulness. Let me just close with one, one final thought. There was a uh, Danish philosopher about 150 years ago, Soren Kierkegaard wrote, one of the more important books probably in Christian history. It's called The Sickness Unto Death. And the Cliff Notes version of it is he basically says, every human being, is every human being without exception, is building their identity on something or someone other than God. And what we spend our lives doing then is we spend our lives in constant comparison and in constant boasting and constantly what that does is it causes divisions and it makes us miserable and it makes the world around us miserable. And I would venture to say, now for like 5 to 10% of you right now, the thing that is making you most unhappy in life might be something big and catastrophic and whatever else. But for the vast majority of us, the thing that makes us most happy, the thing that makes us more miserable than anything else is a swollen awareness of self. So end that. Think only of Jesus who thought only of you 
and then you can find joy. Let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we will not rest until our hearts rest only in you. So empty us of ourselves. Empty us of our worry. Empty us of our pride, our fears, our hope. Empty us of our accomplishments and empty us of our failures. Just empty us of ourselves so that we can find our entire identity in you. And may it be to the glory of your name. Amen. We'll join now in singing our next song.
In our prayers tonight, uh, we'd like to include a prayer for Pastor Lyre and his family. Actually, two big things happened just on Tuesday. Uh, Pastor Lyre's mother, Mother Leah, was called home to heaven on Tuesday after 95 years upon the earth. And the funeral is actually this afternoon uh, at St. Lucas on the south side here of Milwaukee, where she's been uh, a member for a long time and where her husband served as a pastor for many years. Uh, that same day, actually, in our district, Wells District elections, uh, we belong, if you don't know, there's 12 districts in our national church body. We belong in the southeastern district of that church body, so the southeastern Wisconsin um, area. And uh, Pastor Lyre was elected to be the first vice president of our southeastern Wisconsin district. Uh, it's nice to have him serving on our district presidium. Um, and somebody who knows uh, the operations and the unique um, the aspects of urban ministry that might not be quite the same around uh, all the rest of uh, the country, but uh, we're really excited to have him serving in that way, and that's going to be a huge blessing to us too. So we're going to thank the Lord for those two things. Uh, we want to keep in our prayers and thank the Lord for our, our Juneteenth celebration. Now, if you don't know, St. Marcus has annually uh, held a Juneteenth celebration every year on this weekend. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with what Juneteenth is. Uh, I'm a little ashamed to admit that before I got to Milwaukee, I didn't know what it was either. Uh, it's now, you know, very much on the national radar, and it's a really important thing for us to celebrate. You know, I, I, it seems obvious to me now, but ju the word Juneteenth is essentially a mashup of the words June and 19th, and it remembers the day back in 1865 when slaves in Texas finally learned that they were liberated from uh, slavery. They learned about their emancipation. It's the oldest known celebration of black freedom of slavery, and it's really, really, really important now as ever that we thank God for it. And so as a congregation, what we do is on that Sunday morning, so tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, we'll have kind of our annual Juneteenth celebration, uh, but we're going to include that in our prayers tonight here too. Uh, last thing also, obviously this uh, weekend we celebrate Father's Day, and again, whenever we do Father's Day and Mother's Day, uh, I always get that there is this kind of strange confluence of emotions, because depending on who you are and depending on what your experience was, that is either a good day, a bad day, a painful day, a joyful day, uh, any number of different emotions. Last year was the first Father's Day I celebrated after my dad had passed away and gone to heaven. That was the that was hard. I, it was so. My point is, I get depending on your experience, there's probably a combination of uh, thoughts and emotions. What I think it ultimately points to, like anything in life that's truly good, what it points to is the ultimate reality of a heavenly, eternal Father too. So we thank God for that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we want to extend our love and compassion to Pastor Lyra and his family, who mourn the loss of his mother. She lived a long and full life here on earth, which we're grateful for. But we're also grateful that at such an age, uh, she'd be called home. Heaven with you, with our loved ones who have departed in your name, that is ultimately where we are longing to be as Christians. And so we ask that you comfort the family at this time with promises of resurrection and reconciliation. We also ask that you please work through Pastor Lyra uh, in the governance of our church's district. The gospel needs are great, and we need leaders who will help guide workers. So bless his efforts in this regard. Lord, this weekend, we celebrate the deliverance from the disgusting thing of slavery that took place in our country. And uh, while this deliverance, this first celebration was 150 years ago, and, and while laws were changed, we also understand that much hurt, pain, suffering, and oppression remained. Uh, black Americans still feel the impact of the nation's sins from years ago, and we have many of our own sins still today. And so we ask that you help us be quick to listen and slow to speak. Help us seek mercy and justice and love. 
Help us neither deify nor demonize the nation in which we live. And help us as Christians who have been freed from the slavery of sin to work hard, to speak up, to sacrifice for and champion the liberation from all types of personal and social enslavement. Help us to do so with grace and patience and courage and conviction to the glory of your name. And lastly, Lord, we also thank you for the blessings that you provide through fathers, as well as other male role models, grandfathers, guardians, and all others in our lives. There's something um, about the strength and stability of godly men that puts our hearts at ease, and we're grateful for that. But Lord, not all of us have had positive experiences to this end in our lives. And therefore, on weekends like this, we also give thanks in knowing that even, even the best earthly fathers simply point to you as our eternal heavenly father. We look forward to being home with you. We thank you for your protection, your generous providing, your involvement in our daily lives, and for guiding us through this very difficult life. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in your name, and we join in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. It's at this time that uh, I'm going to ask Addie to play a little bit of traveling music for us. And anybody who doesn't, uh, is not planning on communing here this evening, you are free to be dismissed and go, and that is totally fine. These are all choices that people are making on their own right now. Perfectly fine if you choose to do so. Uh, for those of us who are staying, we're going to continue with the rite for Holy Communion here in a second. For those of us who are worshiping with us at home, it's at this time that we are going to let you go. But before we do, I want to remind you of a couple quick things. Remember, this coming Wednesday night is our congregational meeting. Please join us either in person here in the sanctuary or online via Zoom. That'll be at 7 o'clock. Look for the link in our weekly email. Um, and we will say bye to you at this point. God bless and have a good night.